we are organizing the series of uh, conferences with the lead the future that is uh, an italian uh, community where we basically do, do mentorship so we pair uh, university students with uh, mentors that are both in industry and uh, in uh, academia and this is the third uh, the third talk that uh, we we organize so thank you a lot uh, nathan for for joining uh, uh, right now, uh, like uh, uh, Nathan is a research scientist at uh, Agin Face, and he received his PhD from uh, Berkeley, working at uh, the intersection of machine learning and robotics. And uh, he was advised by Professor Pister uh, in the Berkeley Autonomous Microsystem Lab, and Roberto Calandro at Meta AI Research. Um, he was also lucky to internet Facebook AI and DeepMind during uh, his PhD. And uh, it was uh, uh, during his time at Berkeley, he was also awarded uh, the Dimitri Angelakos Memorial Achievement Award for altruism for his efforts to better community norms. Uh, feel free to, to start. Yeah, thanks for the intro, Eric. And thanks, Eric and Julia, for having me and going to kind of walk you through a research journey that was my PhD. So this is a little bit more of a talk that conveys the journey of what I was working on than just trying to throw a bunch of technical details at you. So hopefully it's a little bit more accessible for a broader audience than only machine learning researchers. So I'm going to talk about how we can synthesize robotic controllers with model based reinforcement learning. To start my PhD, what I was working on was these kind of novel robotic platforms. So Professor Pister, who was my advisor, was working on these micro robots, which is on the left. But there are also a lot of other novel robots in the world where people are trying to build these new actuators and create autonomous systems. But there's a question of if I create a new actuator that is not well characterized, how do I actually get this robot to do something that I want to do in the world? So if we have some platforms, the question that we're looking at is like, how can we demonstrate control for the first time? And this just kind of means like hover a flying robot, walk a walking robot for the first time. What's going to happen is that we don't have a strong prior on the robot dynamics. We can't write down the dynamics in an analytical set of differential equations. And then also there's a high cost per test because with novel robotic platforms, what's often happening is that a grad student assembles these and then said grad student wants to graduate when it actually works. So like, but that's a lot of time investment into actually making the thing. So breaking it is really bad. And then the solution, if we want to generate a controller for these new robots, what will happen is that we need to manage changing and challenging dynamics. A lab bench is never as static as we want it to be. So there will always be things in the world that change. And then also the solution needs to be extremely sample efficient. So that means whenever we're running the robot, we're getting a lot of information out of it. And hopefully the solution that we're employing will get better over time. So specifically what I started with was um, I came in to my PhD and I was shown this open loop flight video of the Ionocraft. So this um, micro flyer in the top right, it actually uses ion thrust by using high voltage to ionize the air and generate a airflow. And the question is, with these four little actuators, you can see the grid, those are four different actuators. How can we generate a controller for this robot? So if we kind of go to the drawing board as a person in electrical engineering or computer science, like we have this goal, we have our method for control and it needs to manage challenging dynamics and kind of be agnostic to the dynamics of the system that we're looking at and be really sample efficient. So from this, there's kind of a whole list of methods that we could try to use to generate controllers. And these range from something called system identification with state space methods. So if you think there's some core properties of the robot that you need to identify, like some mass, some moments of inertia. You might want to try to identify those with certain state space methods and more linear systems work. We could try to do PID tuning, which has shown to work really well in the real world. A lot of process flows use complex PID architectures and they work really well. Or some of these more hot topics could come in such as different types of reinforcement learning. And we'll talk more about reinforcement learning later, but generally it's this framework for learning to maximize an objective function via trial and error with the world. So they're a lot, a lot more agnostic to the system and they take less structure, but you can kind of break down these methods in different ways. Some of them are model-based, which means that you're learning or creating some model of a robot by gathering information about the world. 
and some are analytical, which means you're actually going to write down an equation for a transfer function for some dynamics as a differential equation and try to get those into a very expressible mathematical form. And then some of them are kind of just iterative, or we can also call these data-driven methods. The data-driven methods interact with the world and they improve autonomously over time. And then the question is, like, why do we actually, my, why might we want to use these data-driven methods for robotics? So here are some famous examples from the DARPA Robotics Challenge in 2015. So in, about seven years ago, some groups of the best engineers built these robots in labs, and they were tasked to go out into these new scenarios and try to solve relatively mundane everyday tasks, like opening the door. And the way that these failed were really dramatic and kind of surprising. And like what we want to do machine learn, use machine learning for is kind of to help bridge the gap from lab to reality. So when we have these environments that we know a robot can actually do, express, like it can express the movement. So the actuators in these robots can open the door. There's just this change of distribution in the real world that makes it really hard to do this. So the question is like, how do we use machine learning and these modern tools to solve these problems? So this is kind of where the trade-offs between data-driven or iterative methods and analy analytical methods come in. So these data-driven methods don't require a prior on the world and can kind of incorporate this real world data as they learn a controller. So hopefully this can solve some of these challenges we saw in the DARPA robotics challenge. Well, the analytical methods, like we need to know a pretty precise definition of the world ahead of time, but they do come with the strength of when you know the world, you can get a very good controller and very little real world time. But that assumption kind of breaks down when we're working on these new robots so we don't know how to characterize. So if we want to try to use a data-driven method, then the question is like model-based versus model-free. If you look into reinforcement learning literature, this is a classic problem, which is like, and it goes even deeper into kind of the theory of intelligence and like how the human brain works is like, does intelligence use models and what would the models be used for? So if you look into the literature, the model-based methods are generally touted for a lot of benefits, such as like generalization, being able to reason offline because you have some learned representation of the world. But most importantly to my applications is that they are known to be sample efficient. Generally, the sample efficiency comes from constraining the learning process. The learning process is trying to maximize the objective function. It constrains the learning process to a dimension that is easier to learn faster. So it's just kind of making the learning problem a little bit more constrained. Well, model-free methods can kind of take on open-ended tasks and they're often easier to implement and can work, it just can be easier to get running, but they're more data hungry and just kind of aren't as interpretable as these systems where you would learn a model. So kind of the conclusion that I came for in my research to kind of fly the Anacraft or other novel robots is to use kind of model-based data-driven methods. And there's other famous examples that do things like this. Like it's well documented that Boston Dynamics uses model-based control. So a form of model-based control is model predictive control to generate these acrobatic motions. And kind of the goal of my research during my PhD is kind of achieved performances like this, but transitioning robots outside of the lab. So this is a lab environment where all the control is running in real time but it would still be a lot harder to do in an environment that is less well known. So generally the solution that could incorporate all of the things I've talked about as the strengths that I'm looking for is something called model-based reinforcement learning. And generally this is a variation of the reinforcement learning loop that while an agent is improving, the agent will act in the environment. Here you can see like AT is an action and that goes into the environment and the environment returns some state and some reward. Reward is what we want to be maximizing here, which is a little r. And then the agent can kind of use this information to keep acting over time. And that as it accumulates more data from the states and the actions, it'll learn to model the dynamics. And here's an example equation showing maximizing the log likelihood of a distribution. So if you model the transitions in the world, so you take once the, the world is discrete, so each transition between states can be modeled as a probability distribution where you take a, an action at the current state, you're going to result in a state at the next time. And we can learn to model that distribution with a neural network. 
And then if we have a model of the world, we can then do some optimization to select an action that maximizes the reward that we will get from the environment. And if we keep letting this agent run over time, uh, then it should return higher rewards and learn a model of the dynamics of the world. So this is a method that I'm gonna come back to in the talk. So I'll pause and if anyone has questions on what I've covered so far, I think it will be useful to go into. And if not, I'll just keep going. One question I was wondering is about the non-stationarity of the, of the dynamic. You said that uh, very often you consider non-stationary dynamics or at least that dynamics that change. And I was wondering, how do you deal with that? If you model the dynamic with a one-step uh, function. Yeah, so the, the equation shown here doesn't capture it in a nuanced way. You can do some things like filtering out data and just kind of prioritizing more recent data and it'll kind of average over the dynamics. And I think that's really a kind of cutting edge research area, which is like how to actually incorporate that and train that. But it's definitely something that people are looking into. And it's definitely not represented well, so that's a good question. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so generally so far, I talked about the motivation for my work and kind of introduced model-based trial. I'm going to now go a little bit deeper onto model-based reinforcement learning and show kind of how this could work in an example that we've worked on, and then kind of take this into future directions from there. So if we have a one-step model, we can kind of look at this transition function, which is we can predict the next state as a function of the current state and the current action. How do we actually use that to make an agent that can make decisions? So what we will do is if we have a current state, we'll kind of unroll into the future. So here you can see we pass the output of the model back into itself to predict two steps into the future. And if we do this more times, we'll go, what we can plan via compounded network passes. And then eventually like we can predict a bunch of different trajectories. So here are the trajectories that you see are from different action distributions result in different predicted states. And then, what we need to do is then take this kind of unrolling process. It's called unrolling the trajectories with respect to a policy where the policy is proposing actions to pass into the model. What we want to do is figure out how to actually use this for model-based RL, which is in this loop of agents making decisions, agents getting more data, retraining models, and actually solving tasks. So what we'll do is we'll kind of keep this unrolling and we'll use this in a sample-based model predictive control Tasks. So model predictive control is a general framework for selecting actions when you have a model of the world. So what we do is we take these predicted trajectories and we pass them into a simple max, like argmax, which just looks at the action distributions we gave it and it selects the action that has the highest predicted reward. And once we have the action with the highest predicted reward, we pass this back into the, the agent or the model and we actually execute that action. You can see here I've highlighted the difference between what the model thought the chosen sequence would do. So there's always going to be a difference between the dynamics that actually evolve and what the agent thought would happen. So now if we repeat this process of planning into the future, selecting an action, executing an action, eventually we'll get a lot of data and we can then retrain the dynamics model, which will kind of shift how the predictions happen. And ideally the predictions will get more accurate which then allows the agent to solve more tasks. So then the next question is, how do we actually use this to control? So if we go back to the earlier example, what I wanted to do was kind of use some novel control generation method to generate the first flight of a robot. So here you can see the Anacraft kind of modeled similarly to some other robots you might know. And what we did is we took this four thrusted robot and we said, okay, a quadcopter is very similar. This quad rotor we bought actually has the same onboard sensors as the Anacraft. And we wanted to see if we can use model-based RL to generate a low level controller of the Clarity Fly to try to validate the method to go back to novel robots. So what we did is we could communicate with this quad rotor via a radio connection to a computer. And we had the same kind of loop where we took in state data from the IMU, which is an inertial measurement device. And then we trained a model to predict the mostly Yopit 
yaw pigeon roll of the robot. And then we unrolled trajectories to select the action, which was motor voltages. And if we apply this over time, what we did is we set the reward function to be minimizing the pigeon roll. So generally we want the robot to be flat in the air rather than tilted. And then we just use the onboard inertial measurement unit sensors, which is yaw pitch roll and then linear and angular accelerations. And we applied motor voltages directly to the robot. So we didn't have any onboard controllers on. And generally we wanted to see like, how can this work? And if you want to work in robotics in the real world, generally there's a lot of hurdles that you have to do. So generally, this is just one of many attempts where we thought it might be flying and there's a lot of weird dynamics in the world. And in this case, there's an interesting mechanism where quadrotors that fly close to the ground kind of make a pillow effect of them because you blow air at the ground, some of it comes back up and that can give you kind of a stable manifold to fly. So we spent a lot of time not knowing if things were learning or doing random actions and just crashing. But eventually we got to the point where the behavior was clearly getting better over time. And what we did was we took a bunch of random flights where the model didn't know anything. And then we would retrain the model about every 10 flights. And over time, the performance got noticeably better where all it's trying to do is not flip over. So this is on just a couple minutes of flight data, which is definitely sample efficient. We could fly these things for a couple minutes without breaking them. And what happens is this can kind of stabilize itself, but because it doesn't know where it is in the world, it kind of drifts off and then it has the encounter with the wall. And this is a pretty common failure mode of is because it doesn't know where it is in space, it's gonna crash and actually harm itself. But in terms of low level control, it was solving the task that we wanted it to. So generally this is the same video on, on the left, but this was one of the first demonstrations of model-based RL on real robots. And it's pretty clear that it's not a direct competitor to PID control. PID control is what the default controllers for most of these quadcopters or DJI drones that you see flying around would be. But there's some exciting um, takeaways for like what we were trying to do. And what we were trying to do was actually go and fly the Anacraft. So what we did is then took this back to the lab bench. And this is where more challenges of grad school came in. And this is one of the attempted flights of the Anacraft. And this is just like high voltage depth of assembled robots. So it's definitely not supposed to just arc like that, which is very sad. But this is just goes to show like, there's a lot of failures along the way of getting these things to work, which is pretty, <laughs> it's just like, when you're working in the real world, this is why things need to be sample efficient because things will break more often than they work. But eventually we got this to work all right. And this is a slow motion, like a high speed camera of running a slightly different policy. So what we did is we used the learned model to reason over PID parameters rather than just random actions. And this is pretty close to flight performance. And there's a lot of different ways where you could kind of take this, but it's just showing that we are fairly close to being able to use model-based RL on a lot of different robots. Okay, from here, I want to go a little bit deeper onto issues in model-based RL and kind of open research topics on the machine learning side that I've been working on. And this is kind of like trying to answer the question of why aren't these methods that we've been working with, like what, like what might be limiting the long-term performance of them and the current performance of the methods that we have. So if we look at model learning from control, there's kind of a key intuition where the accuracy of the model should be correlated with the performance. This is to say, if you have an accurate model, your actual performance should get better. And in practice, what this looks like, if we take this back to the kind of notation and equations I showed earlier on, is if we maximize that log likelihood formulation, then the episode reward, the agent's performance should improve. But in practice, this ends up being kind of murky territory where it's not entirely true. And this kind of relates to the origins of model-based RL. So system identification is a method in kind of control theory where you want to obtain a task agnostic and sometimes global model of the world. So these kind of blue arcs represent something called elicitation trajectories. And elicitation trajectories are kind of a, are a set of predefined motions 
where it, you can collect data that covers the whole state space. And then you could learn one model for, for the world and that should be able to give you a good controller. But what's happening in reinforcement learning is that you're actually seeing like a very task specific set of data. And this distribution looks really different. So if we're trying to learn, if we're, we're learning two very different models, but we're assuming that they can be used in the same way for control, there's going to be suboptimality in that system. So the reinforcement learning models are actually very biased and observing a task specific subset. And we wanted to figure out how that actually impacted the controller that we're generating. So if we revisit this model-based RL loop, what we have is that some policy you can think about this is the agent again. The agent interacts with the environment. The environment responds in some way, which is kind of just a set of data. We have the states over time and the rewards over time. And what the agents that we talked about are doing is training a dynamics model with log likelihoods. We're trying to get an accurate model for the world. And then we use that to model to create a policy just by predicting into the future. But what's missing with this kind of biased data problem is that these rewards that we want to maximize are not being used in the dynamics model training directly or in the policy optimization. So we kind of want to learn from the experiences that the agent has had in the past in order to make the actual control in the process of learning control more efficient. So this is kind of seen by the fact that there are two optimizations. So the underlying color back matches up where the, with where the um, optimization is happening in this loop. So the dynamics model optimization is this log likelihood optimization. You can see that there's no notion of reward in it. And then the controller takes the parameters from the dynamics model and uses them to actually select an action. So what we want to be doing is actually linking these two optimizations. And we call this separation of the optimizations and objective mismatch, where the objective of training a dynamics model to be accurate is not matching the final goal of getting an agent that is high performance. So we kind of wanted to dig deeper and kind of understand this underlying assumption, which is that does maximizing log likelihood improve episode reward? And there's a few different ways where you showed this in the paper. And one of them was to, the most fun one was to perform an adversarial attack on the dynamics model performance. So if we took one of these dynamics models that we're using for control, such as the one trained for the quadrator, um, what we wanted to try to do is see if we could find a dynamics models where the quote unquote accuracy is good, but the performance is bad. And this is called an adversarial attack where you're trying to train, you're trying to use some optimizer to kind of make the model worse by kind of just changing the parameters in a way so that you can, you can kind of optimize one metric and by proxy decrease another. And the famous example of adversarial attack is generating images that make a computer vision model return totally crazy predictions. So like generate random noise that makes the computer vision model think that it is a dog. And what we did specifically was we tried to op optimize the parameters of the neural network dynamics model to lower the reward by keep, while keeping accuracy the same. So we did this on this little toy task, which is called carpool, where you're trying to balance the pull. And what we found was that we were pretty readily able to decrease the reward on the task over time while maintaining the accuracy of the model. So on the left here, you can kind of see the um, path that the genetic algorithm took over the search space of lowering model accuracy. So really what this amounts to is the genetic search algorithm, CMAES, or some evolutionary algorithm, is changing the weights and biases of the neural network such that the log likelihood on the test set remains about the same, so the accuracy doesn't really go down, but the reward on the task is actually decreasing. So what does this actually mean? It can be kind of confusing at first glance. And what's happening is that when you're doing a control problem, there tends to be a few actions that are really important to getting high performance. And by changing the model accuracy on just a couple of key states, you can get the performance to drop. You can get the performance to drop at these key states, but on average, the model accuracy doesn't really change. And this kind of matches with how neural networks are trained, which is like 
with batch gradient descent. And if we're averaging over these batches to get the model accuracy, one point having lower accuracy won't matter as much. But when we're actually using the model at the end of the day, that one point could be really important. So the idea is that we need to kind of change model training for reinforcement learning to make it that the model is prioritizing the important actions. And this kind of redefining of the search space for dynamics models kind of falls into ways to mitigate this objective mismatch issue. And just to talk about them in brief, I saw that there's a chat message. Okay, that's okay. Just to talk about them in brief is we can change the prediction mechanism for the model, or we can kind of do what I was hinting at and reweight the dynamics model data around the task of interest. So there's a lot of different things that we could do, but essentially this is bringing the dynamics modeling to be more closely mirrored to how we're gonna use the model. And how we're gonna use the model is to kind of predict into the future and select the best action. And if our dynamics model is designed to do that, we can get agents that have more reliable performance. Okay, and while I'm kind of talking about reliable performance is kind of where I'm gonna lead into some of my future work and directions and what I'm doing at my job at Hugging Face. So if we revisit sample-based MPC, I was kind of hinting at like, we wanna have reliable performance. We kind of have this feedback loop here. And the question is like, is this reliable? I showed you a bunch of failures of robots during my talk, so clearly it's not perfect. And kind of the point where I, the entrance point, what I'm interested in is if we unroll a trajectory, what causes this gap between the true future dynamics and the chosen sequence is like, what causes the gap in reality? What causes the actions that we took to create this gap and kind of like, what are the sources of errors? And we should be able to have a, it's, if we don't know the exact cause, we should at least have a set of terminology we can use to understand why the agents might be failing. And this is really broadly motivated by the goal of having AI agents that can act in the real world. If we're gonna let them act in the real world, they'll have more impact and we need to understand what they're doing. So to kind of zoom back out, like there are a lot of companies working on building artificial agents in the wild. And a lot of them are out of Google and Google owned companies where they're solving large scale robotic tasks or solving games far beyond human level. And these developments are primarily enabled by reinforced learning and kind of the scale of compute and the scale of machine learning. And as we keep doing this, we're gonna see these recent successes translate to dynamic and unstructured domains where the kind of social impact of the work be even greater. And some of these biggest open-ended problems for society are things such as autonomy, autonomous systems, biological systems, financial markets, logistics. And what we're seeing is that, especially in the more scientific and engineering side of things, people are already applying these model-based RL algorithms to these domains. So the algorithm from DeepMind is mu zero, and, and companies outside of DeepMind, such as Tesla, are trying to use this for driving. DeepMind is applying this to many different spin-off companies and projects to try to advance the state of the art in the sciences. And I'm sure that companies are doing it for financial markets and logistics, but just not telling us yet. And what I was kind of motivated on by understanding, trying to understand these model-based neural agents is the question of if these artificial agents are reliable. So there's some famous existing works on existing machine learning failures, such as every time a Tesla autopilot crashes, that's a failure. And there's also these fairness results where the models are shown to be extremely biased in proportion to the data that they're working on. And with reinforcement learning agents, these agents are known to be very exploitative of the environment. So what I'm wondering is like, how can we constrain these agents when we know they are extremely powerful and can fail in the real world, but we're adding this flavor of reinforcement, which is this trial and error learning, which is prone to exploitation and adds a temporal nature to the problem, so it's really hard to characterize. And I think as we're deploying machine learning at scale, this temporal problem is gonna become even more important. So I'm trying to figure out a way to make what I call legible artificial agents in the wild, which is really studying how an agent's experience evolves over time. And it kind of looks at this reinforcement learning loop where there are multiple notions of feedback. So if any reinforcement learning algorithm has this control feedback, which is the agent takes an action and then it's returned to state, but also over time, this agent is learning on its own 
And those behavioral feedback can have really dramatic effects when the agent is kind of operating in the real world. So what I'm interested in, just kind of the wrap up the links between model-based RL and kind of societal impacts of machine learning are that we can create a set of terminology and tests for legible reinforcement learning to try to understand what the important actions are. And like, if we know the important actions and those at certain moments in time, we can understand how to better avoid unsafe regions for our agents at control time, and also try to estimate the long-term behavior of the agents. So if we have a very powerful reinforced learning agent acting in the real world, what is stopping it from actually getting unintended behaviors that might just bias or harm certain groups? And these things will all play out over time. So we have to be able to forecast into the future with what might be happening for the reinforced learning agents. So to kind of like take a step back, I showed that model-based RL is a candidate for doing so, but kind of having this model about the world lets the agents reason in a way that human designers could actually audit the dynamics models. And this combination of performance where we were able to do things that people hadn't done before, which is just kind of learn to fly robots from scratch, while also getting these models of the world that we can then use for future things like trying to mitigate harms and actually understand how reinforcement learning evolves over time. So with that, I wanted to kind of thank my collaborators through my PhD, and I will be adding more soon now having a job, but these people show up in many different ways throughout this work, and I'm happy to take questions about this. I think I covered a lot of different topics, but hopefully it was entertaining and opens the door to some interesting discussions for careers or whatever you all have. It seems to me that this uh, idea of objective mismatch that you talked about is quite aligned with the decision aware in reinforcement learning workshop at ICML. If I'm not wrong, there's an yeah. entire workshop around this idea. So it, it's quite uh, important, I guess, recently. Yeah, I should probably go to that workshop. I have to figure out what it is. I've heard about it multiple times, but it's kind of like zoned out and I took a couple months off starting a job and just said no to everything for a while. And now I'm trying to rejoin yeah, the academic community it's a hard business match it's about this mismatch yeah. I, I know some of the organizers relatively well yeah i'm uh, one of the organizers of the workshop oh I, okay <laughs> I, i've sent a paper just <laughs> since we're talking about this <laughs> <laughs> i should have put more slides in for that i removed stuff from that section because it can get very technical very fast and i wasn't sure it's about very that. by chance <laughs> A lot. It's yeah, nice. one, one thing I was wondering, which is more general, uh, it's not technical at all, and then I'm going to leave the space to other people asking questions, is uh, if you have any suggestions to kind of do internships, research internships at uh, companies like DeepMind or FAIR and such as that. Oops. Yeah, so this is a question that I get a lot and I'm starting to develop answers that I think are reasonable. So like, yes, you should definitely apply online and that's kind of just like always putting yourself out there as like, okay, how how do I like potentially get my shot? Like I got my DeepMind internship by applying online, which I've since learned is relatively unusual. And then the kind of two pathways that I've seen be reliable are meeting people at conferences and talking to them and just like engaging with people that you find interesting and then also like open source contributions. Open source contributions take a lot more time than going to a conference and talking to people and being excited, but it's kind of a direct feed into the brain of a researcher, which is like, okay, you're, you're contributing to their research project and you get to interact with them in a pretty clear way that you've earned if you actually contribute. And that one takes a lot more time, but I, I've seen that one pay off as well. And I think that's something that less people say. It's like networking is very gated by privilege in some ways, which is like, you have to go to the conference, you have to be able to actually get them to respond to your email or anything. That can be hard. Thank you. Thank you a lot. I have a question. Yeah. So I'm Pierre Lucas. Uh, thank you so much for the for the presentation. Uh, so my question is on this objective mismatch. So in many works in this area, uh, the assumption is that you have a limit of for instance, on the number of samples that you have, or maybe even on the model class that you can use. So for instance, the strongest results, at least theoretically, that you can have on this 
um, is when like your model class is not expressive enough to capture uh, what you need to capture about the world. But on super like in the supervised learning world in this moment, we are seeing the use of uh, very large models with very large uh, amounts of data. And uh, I wonder what is, in your opinion, the interaction of like, these sort of ideas with very large models uh, in that regime? Is these ideas still relevant? Is, is that still important? Yeah, so this is kind of like hitting at the work that I actually am doing that I didn't talk about in my talk, which is like, I think that we kind of need to make reinforcement learning a non-single track problem. So like in single track, I mean, you have one agent, one domain, and you train all of it in one line to kind of design agents that can incorporate agent, incorporate data from multiple tasks. Because in starting at things like where the physics engine is the same. So if you use control suite and everything's a Majoko physics engine, there should be things that generalize across domains, especially if you're just starting with the visual case, like all the rendering is the same. And then if you kind of break down some of those barriers of using data for multiple problems, you'll get more benefits of, of scale. I think until until the data complex until like the kind of the data landscape improves, it's gonna be hard to leverage these big models that are just coming out. And maybe as the tasks get more. Like as the tasks scale up, like if DeepMind was to do mu zero two, like they probably use transformers, but that's just at such a different scale than what most people do research for. So I'm kind of interested in trying to understand how to use like do multi-domain model-based RL, which is like if you train a dynamics model and every task in DeepMind control suite together with some shared gradients in like latent spaces, I, I you should be able to get some improvements and actually some transfer learning there. That's one of the things that I'm like trying to spin up. And I think that that's the type of thinking that people need to do to kind of bridge these gaps. Yeah, thank you. There was that's like one students. question from Julia that uh, was yeah, yeah, exactly. uh, written uh, about the equal access to application assistant at Berkeley that uh, I think you and uh, Julia were co-founder. Maybe I can, I can share the link. Yeah. If yeah, so generally this is pretty funny. So this this started where there's a lot of other schools that were starting this at the same time. And I saw some tweet that Stanford had started the program. And I was like, I think Berkeley grad students care more about these things usually. So we should start a program. And it generally shows the ability to have impact on things that you care about as a grad student. So like we reviewed, I don't know, like the order of a hundred applications in our, in our second year for primarily underrepresented groups applying to Berkeley Eeks, which is generally just like community force among people that care about things, which is like, I kind of was like, hey, we should start this and send a bunch of emails. And then Julia and one other colleague, Aaron joined on and we've made this a real thing that now is like continuing now that we have all graduated. So it's really like, that's a, a short story, but there is the only barriers for our willingness to do it and like once we got our own momentum to do so that it had positive impact on, on people i don't know that's kind of a, a spark notes version <laughs> she might have had a, a different question in mind i've seen that you also just posted uh, like a, a blog about uh, your uh, a job search uh, having a like a phd so I think that also that will be quite interesting to to the audience. Yeah, I, I can, I can send that. the link yeah. to it. Yes. So generally, I just like kept track of what all my interviews and calls were by I did this after the fact by looking at my calendar and looking at all the events that I had. So I didn't do it in the in the time, but. I did a very substantial job search, which is just trying to talk to as many people as possible, which involves a lot of cold emailing and a lot of nudging people that you know and be like, hey, you said you are someone close at this place. Like, can you introduce me? Which can feel awkward the first few times, but definitely is worth doing where you just kind of talk to a lot of people because when you're coming out of an undergrad program or as a grad program is one of the few times where you're kind of expected to do a really wide, broad job search. And this job search, I think, is intended more than just getting you a job, which is meeting a lot of people that you'll then 
cross paths with in the future of your career. So they like, if you go into it with a positive attitude, you have this chance to talk to people that you probably won't get to talk to that many times, but you can kind of lay the seed of kind of your future career steps by just talking to a lot of different companies, even if they're not necessarily ones that you want to work for exactly at the moment. So that's kind of what I did. And then this blog post is kind of the story of that and all of the different places that I looked and some specific takeaways from kind of my field of research. So. And did you also like consider returning uh, to one of the companies where you interned? Like Tesla, Deep, yeah, and, but, uh, Facebook? Yeah, I did an interview with them. I think at least Facebook, they, I don't know, they kind of had some internal squabbles with the team I was interviewing with. You can do your own research and figure out what that means. <laughs> and so that kind of fell through. But DeepMind I was interviewing with for a while and just kind of didn't have the right headcount on the teams I overlapped with. And they definitely expressed that they would want to talk to me in the future. And return offers are definitely a thing, whether or not they're called a return offer. But these companies do like to re recruit the people that have interned from them. So that's a good feeder path. My Tesla internship was too long ago for me to care. And it would not be one of my top companies for reasons undisclosed. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you for sharing this blog post publicly because it, like, it's something that very rarely people do about the like job search and uh, what happens like uh, uh, under the hood. They just share like when they, they get the job. And I think it's gonna help a, a lot of people. That usually, like, if you're usually if you're connected with some uh, uh, people who get the job, maybe you can get this in, this information, this insider information. But many people are, are not connected, so, so they miss this information. And uh, I believe your blog post and your information will have lots of people which have like less of a strong connection with uh, uh, with those companies. So thank you so much, really. Yeah, that was the goal. It's honestly been better received than I thought it would, but I guess I should have known. <laughs> it's, it's definitely interesting. I know people that, like, I've kind of had a weird path to working in machine learning, which I started my PhD not working in machine learning, and it's just like purely robotics. And there's definitely people that have even more insane opportunities in return and all of this stuff, which is kind of, it's a little mind blowing. There's large scales of, I don't know, the machine learning field is, moves fast and is very hard to keep up with, which I think is why people like this information. It's just like a, a, a real data point on what can actually happen. I'm just like finishing my bachelor's degree in computer science. And I was hoping to, to continue with a master's degree in computer science. And I was, um, I mean, since you are based in in the US, I was curious about what do you where which university do you think are worth to apply for a master, in particular in the computer science field and in general. If you have any advice for someone like me in this situation to switch to a master degree, I don't have the best advice. You might want to ask someone who did it more recently, but like. You can definitely just apply to most of the top CS schools. You can find that list somewhere. I can give you practical advice, which is like Berkeley's MS program doesn't really exist for people that haven't talked to a professor. It's almost entirely an MEng program. So there's some weird things to kind of navigate like that. Like Berkeley lists it on their website, but they really don't admit many people unless they've already been having conversations with the professor and the professor is willing to do it. So that's kind of a strange loophole that they don't talk about that like Julie and I found out a lot more from running this application assistance program. Cause we would get like, they get tons of applicants and just no one knows that this program is like generally, it's like unlisted. It's it should be like unlisted, which is like a YouTube video that I can send you the link to. It's like a professor should make, have a special link for people to apply that have this kind of preset track, but definitely try to talk to people and see if there's other schools that do weird shit like that before getting all of your eggs in, in one basket. And yeah, there's school, good schools in Canada as well. If, if you want to go to North America, there's some big machine learning hubs in Canada. Or like maybe another possibility is to just go straight uh, to the PhD and like 
skip uh, skip the master if you want to go US or Yeah, I mean, in fact, I heard also about this possibility, which is more common in the US than like in Europe, where doing a PhD after the bachelor is almost impossible, I think, for, at least for what I know. So, yeah, thank you for the advice and everything. So, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, don't forget about Canada, because for immigration purposes, it's way easier to emigrate to Canada. So, you Minus 10 degrees or minus 15 degrees are not a problem <laughs> for you. <laughs> Think about it. If they are, then maybe California is better. Uh, are you there? Like, the, or it's just like a yeah, like your student as Mila uh, in Montreal. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah. And I come from three cities, so my, minus 20 in the winter is thing. <laughs> got accustomed to. Okay, uh, like if there are no further questions, I guess we can uh, thank Nathan and uh, close uh, close the meeting. And if you like um, already have like other questions or want to, to follow up, I guess you can reach out uh, uh, directly to, to his website. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nathan, and see you next thank time. You. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye -bye. See you.